All right, here we go. <laughs> it's live with Gardner's Hank Barnes. How we doing? We're doing all right. I was telling as we were getting ready, asking if I should put on a hat and be yeah. like, John, I got my local neighborhood at Hank's Downtown Dive. Not a place I own, but probably a place where I could be found from time to time. But we'll leave it yeah. off for today. Okay. Well, if you get inspired, you can you can put it on. Uh, welcome, folks. Uh, this is going to be a good one. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, this is part of my blogs that matter series, and in a little bit, we're going to be diving into what I think is a really important blog post from from Hank here on the democratization of technology and how it's created a new B two B chasm, which actually involved the dialogue that that you engage with with crossing the chasms, Jeffrey Moore. So this is really interesting to see these these ideas develop. And one of the key things for me is that I think blogs still matter. You know, it's we have a lot of social media interactions that could be fun and interesting. But to me, to have the chance to develop the ideas the way you did is really, really important uh, for for anyone who wants to understand what's going on in the enterprise. So thanks, Hank. We're going to get into that shortly. Sounds great. That's great. Uh, so, so yeah, folks, uh, you may be a little surprised that I have someone from Gartner on my show, given that my show is mostly f- folks, you know, who are independent advisors in some way. But I just want to be clear on something about independence. Independence is an aspirational quality. And Hank is an independent thinker. I don't care who he works for. And, uh, yeah, I've been critical of Gartner and will continue to be critical of Gartner. But I also have a lot of respect for Gartner. And my, my fundamental issue is that I don't think uh, – enterprise customers should trust any source. Uh, I, I just don't think Gartner says stone tablets, but I don't think any buyers should trust uh, Diginomica uh, 100% either, Hank. I think I think buyers need to, and customers as they're trying to navigate, they need to be open to a range of viewpoints. That's I think you probably share a similar view. So There's no disagreement. I mean, expertise comes in a lot of different places. And actually, some of the stuff we'll get into when we start talking about the Chasm Post is that you know, you think about the thing everyone knows, you know, loves loves us or hates us for magic quadrants. A lot of the folks that we see struggling are the ones that make decisions based on the graphic. And every partner analyst that writes a quadrant would say that's the worst possible thing you could do. So some of it is how you use it and, and how you confirm. And uh, people, you know, that's one of the challenges. People aren't sure how to deal with all this information that's out there. Yeah. And you and I have had a really interesting I guess I would call it a debate over the years too that I want to get into later around the tensions between the informed buyer and and the problem of buying complexity and inertia that you have harped on a lot. Um, and and I got a cool thing for you. I actually have a surprise because I had as I was preparing, I had a new insight on how to reconcile these two things. So we're going to oh, get into that awesome. as well. But uh, just for the reader's enjoyment, uh, I, I do want to take you back to the early days of Diginomica when I first encountered Hank's work and we first started having this dialogue. Um, and it was a it was a piece I wrote in 2014, about a year after we started, called "Informed Buyers and the Crisis of Tech Differentiation." I just want to read you the first sentence. I said, "When was the last time you sat in on a webinar and said, man, that was really great?' Yeah, me too. <laughs> but I recently had that experience uh, watching a replay of Gartner's sad state of differentiation and what to do about it, and that was how I ran into Hank because Hank, that was your your webinar. And then at the end of the piece, I wrote. Um, uh, let's see, um, if I can find it, uh, during the webinar, Barnes went for the jugular by challenging attendees with some deceptively simple questions. Do you provide a better buying experience than the competition? Do you have the simplest contract to use in the industry? Do you make your products really easy to order and configure? Hank, it sounds like you could have asked those questions yesterday, man. <laughs> Yeah, I could have. I mean, I think, you know, that was the first time we met and I thought, wow, this John guy, he's super nice and easy to deal with and never says anything bad about anyone. I'm, you know, little <laughs> did I know as I yeah. learn more about you and, and the work that Digimonomica does to actually challenge people in good ways. So, but yeah, it, uh, you know, it's interesting buying. I often say buying changes fast and slow and and it's a little bit like erosion where all of a sudden we see that it's changed quite dramatically. But um, there's still mistakes to be made. And, and frankly, we live in a world where it's imperfect. And, you know, we if we assume fe- people know what they're doing and make decisions for the right reasons and are great at decision making, um, then we get surprised. And, you know, at some things you get rewarded by size. You know, size gives you a lot of flexibility to be imperfect. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't all strive to be better. 
Yeah, Maureen's here. She's been giving you a hard time on Twitter. She wants me to go in on you and, and keep you in the hot seat. She says he went for the jugular. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, he did. I mean, that's one of the things I enjoy about about Hank's work is that he's not afraid to uh, call out. In particular, Hank, I think you've done a really good job of calling out vendors for kind of empty marketing that doesn't really speak to customer needs. And that's one thing that fascinates me about your work. And I want to get into this with you a little bit as far as just to help uh, the audience. I want you to understand a little bit about how Hank forms his point of view on the market before we get into his blog. Because I think what's interesting, Hank, is that you focus a lot on on buyer behavior in, in terms of what vendors should look at, but it seems like you always kind of take a customer view. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about, you're technically the chief of research focused on enterprising buyer behavior in Garner's tech and service provider team. Tell us a little bit more about sort of what that means and how you form your view on the market. Well, that was a mouthful to get out on that title, so I apologize for it being no that worries. long. But you know, that's it's kind of what we got. I actually, to tr I, I truncated your bio. It's, it goes on much longer. So yeah, yeah, but, uh, with a lot of uninteresting stuff in it too. I mean, I, I want to come back to one thing before I talk about how we form our point of view because I think it's important. Um, and this is not just a vendor problem. And it, you know, if if we if we hoist all the issues on vendors being bad, it's a shared problem. There's shared issues on both sides, and that's one of the things that we see. Um, but what I'll say about how we approach the research, it, it actually started when I joined Gartner. Um, you know, I'd come from a bunch of startups, and I worked at some big companies, Adobe and SAP, and places. And they brought me in to be part of a team that was to advise tech vendors on go-to-market strategies, and. You know, oftentimes when you with a lot of companies, the way you do that is is, and again, this is kind of a worse practice, but you, you get well. Let's see what other vendors are doing, right? I still remember when I was at another large company that's pretty close to where I am in Research Triangle area, and I was told that I had to put agile into all of our messaging because everybody else in the market was saying they were agile, and yet you know it would take the stuff we were changing wasn't agile at all, but we had to say it. Uh, and so I said, you know, rather than me study what other vendors are doing in terms of practices, I think what we should do is study what customers are doing. And the best way to be better is to understand what customers are doing and what they're needing and how we can help them. So that started it. Um, the way we really largely, the buying research that we do, we do several, well, every year we do a large scale study. Um, We've actually evolved it over the course of years where we do it in a three-year cycle now. Um, these studies are not of Gartner clients, to, to be clear. It's an independent panel, but we have a research team. I don't have to do this stuff on my own. Um, that we work together to build the studies, typically have about 1,500 responses for that from multiple places around the world, multiple roles. Um, and then we supplement them with other studies. So like last year, we did a cloud buying behavior study in IT services. We've just completed one on emerging technology. But our big things are a cycle of three. And the first year, what we look at is overall buying activity. How much time do, you know, how many different buying efforts do companies kick off and how many of them actually result in them doing anything and what's getting in the way of those things? Um, that's the first one. And because the, the one thing that we also see is your competition else isn't often the people competing for your deal. It's all the other stuff going on in the company. The second one, and, and this is a study that's in the field and I, I'm so excited. I hope it really comes back with the data that I'm seeing because we've been able, we focus on a single deal. So we asked the respondents to focus on the biggest purchase that they were involved in and really drive into the dynamics of that, who was involved, what was hard, what was not. And then the third year in the cycle, we look at really decisions around subscription business, renewal decisions, expansion decisions, cancellation decisions, and things of that type. Um, like I say, we got stat people that do the initial work for us, but we have tools where we can explore and develop new insights. And it, there's a lot of collaboration to look at the data. And then where we can, this is where we go to the other parts of Gartner and say, this is what we're seeing in our study. Does this, you know, does this hold water? Because I would never trust a study 100% either, no matter how good it is. It's, you know, it's as good as the sample. Um, and as we validated and tested and people say, you know, that's the stuff that's feeling. And that's kind of what I'm hearing with a lot of our research is people, I just had a call with a client today and they said, you know, what you just took me through really articulates all kinds of stuff I've been feeling, but I haven't been able to say it. Mm. 
Well, Maureen, I can't really criticize things like the Magic Quadrant and, and Gardner Research if Hank's applying the criticism himself. So he's doing a good job, actually. And 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 look, uh, I didn't bring Hank on here to, to put Gardner on trial, as I said. So those of you who want me to do that, I'm not going to do that today. But uh, if you want if you want to check out me making fun of some Gardner um, buzzword bingo stuff, check out Vinny Merchandani's interview with me from, from last week. Then you get your fix on that. Um, but look, we all fall into buzzword bingo and e even myself. So I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that I, I never do that. So um, the, the thing I did want to get into though, Hank, that I've noticed a lot in your more recent research is the appearance of this phrase, high quality deal. And this seems to be important. And, and what alarms me a lot of times is when I then read in your blogs that there's not that many high quality deals out there. So can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. So this this is again where there's there's some benefits in in size. Um, Gartner several years ago acquired corporate executive board, right? And and so I, I do a lot of work with the folks that did the challenger model and the challenger customer model. And those teams actually originally created an index. Um, the long form is high quality low regret deal. And the general idea behind it is we're looking for situations where, uh, and the formula is pretty simple, the customer, and, and we do this in a very specific way, which may contribute to the numbers, but it actually bears out. The core part of the formula is we put a statement out there, the product we purchase is failing to meet expectations. And you have to disagree with that. So if you think of a Liker scale, one to seven, you got to score that a one or a two to even be in the ballpark. Right, because we're getting people to say, "Yeah, I'm really happy with it." The disagreement indicates that. Then one of two other things needs to be true. The second condition is we purchase the premium product, and we want them to agree with that with a score of six or seven. The alternative is expectations. Feel good about the expectations, and then we ask. We, it's a disagreement one, but we ultimately we look for more ambitious offerings before settling for what we chose. And they have to disagree with that. So those two things are really regret, right? If my expectations aren't being met and I had to settle for something less, that's a regret. That's the regret component than the other. Um, it, the numbers we typically see for broad populations is around 27% meet that criteria. Now it was, wow. it was interesting. I had um, Gartner, Gartner has acquired a lot of companies and we have a, a big actually review site business, not just Peer Insights, but also Captera and Software Advice and those folks. They took this research that we had done and took it to their population, which is primarily small businesses. Did a study, another thousand customers. Guess what the high quality deal percentage was? Uh, 17%. 27%. A little exact higher. Same, it was the exact okay. same number. It was 27% for both of them. Uh, my, my offhand response is that's not good enough, Hank. I, I think, I mean, if we're only getting a quarter of these folks without regrets, we all have work to do. Absolutely. And this is a shared problem because, yeah. and, and, you know, ultimately, you know, the roads are going to lead to the new chasm. But there's some companies where nearly half their purchases are high quality deals. There's mm -hmm. other companies where it's only 12%. Um, I did a, a quick blog post just on change and a willingness to change. And there's a model we have called enterprise technology adoption profiles. And I took two of the questions in there that effectively ask, you know, are, do you have, you know, a program of strategic technology investment that you do consistently, or do you avoid net new projects? And then do you work with vendors very early in the process, or do you avoid replacing technology all you can? The folks that say they avoid on both of those, it, the folks that said both of those answers and said, we avoid net new and we don't like replacing anything, 4% high quality deal when they actually buy something. Oh my goodness. Right. And it's that it's it's this mindsets and attitudes that kind of shape and get into this. And then it was a little bit higher if they did one or the two, but it was like 12. Um, so. Well, and I think one troubling thing for for those software vendors out there and services vendors providers is that now 
Um, it used to be kind of a hit and run thing of sell a big deal and staff it and move on. But but now you're looking to upsell and, and get long-term subscriptions. And so if there's that type of remorse and regret, that doesn't bode well uh, for you going forward either. So yeah, the only, the only dynamic. thing that, that again, kind of that, uh, that's exact conclusion we reached. The one thing I would say that's a little bit different on that is if you get into one of these companies that hates change, you got to remember they hate change. <laughs> so, so we did a study, a, another study, and there was a little bit of where we, we actually, it was one of these things, the survey early on was out there and we weren't getting the answers we expected. And we said, you know, people are just kind of straight lining the answer. So we got to kind of wake them up and we inserted a statement and it's another one of these one to seven scales. And the statement was, we regret nearly every technology purchase we complete after we finalize the subscription agreement. Mm. 54% agreed with it. Oh, now when we get to the folks that struggle with high quality deals, it rises to 71% that agree with it. And then we looked okay. at the next step and said, the one thing for that, those folks that we call them pessimists, pessimists are much more likely to, to renew an agreement when they're not satisfied because they're never mm. satisfied, right? Yeah. But they're more likely to downgrade and they're less likely to expand. So, Got it. you know, it's, it's, it's not like, it, it, you know, it sucks and you're guaranteed to be replaced. It, but if you recognize that, you, you recognize, you know, what you may be dealing with as you deal with the subscriptions. Tracy Webster saying she's seen that a company that had an SI that was horrible, but they kept them for 3.5 years. So, yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing you, you rail against in, in your blog post. And that's one cool thing about your, your work. And I think that's changed a lot at Gartner as well, where you don't have to subscribe to all the research to get some of the content out of it because you're kind of trying to make sense of it in your, in your blogs as well, which kind of brings, brings us to your, to your blog post. And folks, feel free to continue to comment on just in general, what you're seeing dynamics with um, enterprise buyers and expectations. Uh, we'll try to get to those, but I do want to get into the, these blog posts, um, the key blog posts, and I will go ahead and paste it into the chat. Uh, if you have trouble seeing it, um, you can also do a search uh, based on the title here. Uh, but in September 28th, you came out with a blog post entitled The Democratization of Technology Has Created a New B2B Chasm. And there's a lot of interesting implications of this post, including uh, Jeffrey Moore, who developed this chasm theory. You had to kind of run your changes by him to kind of see what he thought of them, which is kind of an interesting and a little bit uh, perhaps intimidating thing to do in some ways to say, hey, guess what? Uh, we see a different dynamic than the one you originally charted out. Uh, so can you just talk with us a little bit about the origins of this post and kind of the whole dynamic that occurred behind publishing it? Yeah. So we, you know, again, th this has been a long series of things and we were seeing these patterns of behavior um, of ch ch shifts in buying. And, and we, again, we have this model, it's a psychographic model, enterprise technology adoption profiles where we see very different behaviors. What had happened is we, um, our CIO practice did a study and they actually included these questions as part of it. First time I've been able to get them to do that. Um, and basically, if you know, like if you see reports from stat things, they're, you know, the columns with statistical si significance just light up. But um, John Lovelock, our chief forecaster, started taking some of the model when it was people talking about their plans for adoption and building out like histograms and adoption curves that layered these things on top. And we saw kind of this stall and kind of drop off at a certain point when we would think mainstream. And we said, hmm, maybe there's a new chasm. <laughs> and and mm. when we looked at the patterns of companies from all the stuff we'd done before, we saw it as a chasm that's really driven by the companies that are pretty effective and confident in their buying process, the ones that are more likely to have high quality deals, and then the ones mm. that weren't. And so we had that as a starting point. Then, you know, when I, when I said, well, there's a new chasm and what do we have to do about it? Um, I had worked a little bit with Jeffrey Moore when I was at Adobe, when we were launching um, Customer Experience Manager, and, and he spoke at one of our conferences that I chaired. So we've got to know each other and talk through the years. And I was saying, I, I, I want to do this, but there's no way I can do this and not ask him. I mean, like his book has been kind of my guidebook for life. Yeah. Um, and so I reached out and literally within two hours, he said he'd love to talk to me about it. So, you know, that got me jazzed. And then we jumped on the phone and started talking about it. 
And, you know, in the democratization part of it is is the one other element. And that's where mm. we're seeing the biggest question clients come to us with is, Gartner, tell me who's on the buying team for X product. Because it's mm. changing so dramatically as technology decision making gets distributed, where it's not business or IT, it's business and IT, but the composition constantly changes and it's quite inconsistent. Gartner did some research where he found that if you look at companies broadly, about 41% of an employee population in many companies is what we're calling business technologists. It's people that create technologies or analytics capabilities that don't reside in IT. So there's more mm -hmm. people creating technology solutions outside of IT than in IT today. Mm -hmm. So you have all of that thing. It's like, so what's happened is the original chasm, it was all about why people would adopt and win. Right. And he introduced psychographics. It was one of the first use of psychographics. I was going back in and, and because he didn't talk about early adopters, he talked about visionaries. And he made the great point that visionaries will adopt if they see an opportunity for order of magnitude improvement. You take a new product to the market and it doesn't have that improvement. They're not going to adopt at that time. So that's the yeah, starting and, point. And, and just, just for folks who don't have all the background on that, I think, I think one of the reasons why this became so significant is that the chasm is highly disruptive to, to any software provider, right? Because when you hit that, you lose all your momentum. And, and the notion behind it originally was that, yeah, visionaries might glom onto something, but that's not going to mainstream your product. And when you hit that chasm, all the momentum goes away. And you're sitting there saying, what the hell happened? Um, and, and, and I see that all the time today with different vendors who, you know, I think get excited about early adoption and then, whoa, what happened? And, and it's significant what you're saying here because you're saying that now you've identified a little bit further on in the cycle. And we can share the graphic if readers want, but you can also see it in the blog that there's now a little bit further on, there's a new chasm. And the surprising thing about that to me is you would think the reverse, right? Because you would think, wow, as software is spreading throughout the organization and more business users are making decisions about software, we should have an easier time uh, with, with adoption, but that's not what you're finding. No, no. And, and really, so, I mean, you kind of hit up exactly the chasm and the whole idea of the first chasm was what you needed to do is take from great technology that innovators, techies and visionaries can figure out what to do with it to actually be very, you know, have best practices and they called it whole product, everything a need to take the risk out of the decision. Well, you know, that's almost like building up the content complex and, you know, you're, you're building all these assets. And frankly, the folks that adopt then in our model love information. They crave it, right? When if we do studies where we ask people how much to use what we would call post-sales content to make a decision, and they eat up as much of that as they can. They want your implementation guide before they buy. They want migration guides. They want all of this stuff. And then you hit the second chasm, and it's a bunch of people that really don't want to put in the work, right? They are the folks that literally make decisions off the graphic. Right. And when we ask them, they're like, we're overwhelmed by information. Are you interested in seeing an implementation guide? Not really. And and so they don't put in the work. And so you build up all these assets. Maybe you've done stuff that we call buyer enablement, given all these tools. And all of a sudden you have these people that say they're overwhelmed by it. They don't want any of it. And you got to go back to a new model of actually relentlessly simplifying to, to mm -hmm. net it out for them and make the decision easy. So if you gave like business model tools or value calculators, the, the back half of the curve want you to fill in all the defaults so that they can say they did the work. Right. So just to dig into this a little bit further, I'm going to read from your post. Uh, you talked about what's driving this new chasm. If, if there's any typos in there, just make sure you correct I'll, I'll skip the typos. The, My the driver, at me about that. <laughs> the driver is the democratization and pervasiveness of technology in business. Today, we are seeing more and more people from more and more different functions becoming part of technology buying teams, whereas in the past, most decisions were driven by IT departments. And then your point is, with this dispersion has also emerged a crisis of competence and confidence which is not good. I, I'm adding that part. The new chasm. This is a chasm that emerges at some point in the middle of the early majority stage before you get to the late majority. It is before the peak because Gardner sees these issues in more than 50% of organizations. And so as part of that, what you did then is you started to 
want to understand, well, how are we going to make sense of this so-called new chasm and how are you going to get through it, right? And yep. so you developed through these ETA marketing cl clusters, several different groups uh, that, that that map to the model and then, and then one that you say doesn't map to the model. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So the marketing clusters are things we've used to simplify it because what, again, if you think about the original psychographics, they told me, you know, when people would adopt in like broad scale, why, what they were looking for. I'm, you know, I'm looking for advantage. I'm looking for low risk, et cetera. Um, ETAs add in elements of how and who, how they're going to approach buying and who's going to be involved. Um, and what we see is that there's pairs of ETAs that approach buying in the same way. The timing may change pretty dramatically. Um, and so that's an element of that. So those, there's a folk, set of folks that are very strict planners that you have a technology vision that guides them. They have high quality deals. They make great decisions. They're thorough evaluators. They're all of that. Mm -hmm. Then you have the other folks that would actually prefer not to invest in technology. Um, and they're the ones that struggle. Like it's really interesting when we look at the size of buying teams. The size of buying the the folks that are strict planners have slightly smaller buying teams and slightly less decision makers, but they have more functional groups involved. So they mm. actually get diverse perspectives in the organization, but they're pretty clear on decision responsibilities and rights. The folks that struggle with high quality deals have more people involved and more decision makers, and it's almost like it's past the buck decision making. Um, mm. So that's some of the struggles that we see. Yeah, I want to hit on a couple more things that really jumped out. Um, when you went through those uh, different types in the post, you said, based on these descriptions, the new chasm becomes obvious. You move from organizations that value technology and put in the work to succeed to those that are cautious and conflicted, lacking the confidence in tech and themselves, while at the same time having more people involved in decision-making ouch <laughs> and, and that ouch is for me and, and then you say like the original chasm they require very different tactics from vendors so so i think that's what's interesting about what you've done here is that you you have laid out a problem but now you're trying to make sense for us about okay well how are we going to respond to these conditions and and one other point that i think i hope is a wake-up call for those who are watching this right now. And by the way, you guys are being a little quiet today, so it's time for you to start airing out your opinions. Please, please don't be shy. Um, that doesn't really work in my show to be shy. So start speaking up. Um, you said here, the issue is not about potential value. It's about fear of change. That, that was a big one for me because how, because so, so many of us are obsessed with making the value prop. And I think you're implying there that if we only focus on a value proposition, we're going to miss something really important. I mean, it's for sure. And I, I you know, it, there's a, been some interesting things um, that have played in that one. And I ended up doing some companion posts. To, you know, my, I use posts to show some new research and also to test ideas. And and part of it is a lot of people don't know that about this part of Gartner's business. So a lot of tech vendors don't even know I exist. Um, and maybe this will help change some of that too. Um, but we had a, um, our, our, we have a marketing practice and they look at B2B marketing broadly, not just for tech. And they did a study. It's actually one of my favorite studies because, um, one of their hypotheses going into the study was that the key to increased engagement is increased personalization. Mm. And they were able to prove that hypothesis. But the next thing they learned is that the more you personalize, the more likely you are to see delays in deals. Interesting. And why, why do you think that is? We spend, and the, the problem with personas is we spend so much time trying to find what the persona uniquely cares about that we forget that they're buying in the context of the organization versus buying for themselves unless they're behaving really badly. And rather than spend time trying to figure out what uniquely appeals to them, we need to find the common ground because that's kind of the consensus decision-making problem. Mm. But the thing that I want to add to that to actually answer your question more directly, they looked at the types of content that had the biggest impact in terms of accelerating deals and accelerating success and accelerating um, high-quality deals. And they called it change enablement content. 
you needed to show people what the change would look like. And so when I talk to folks like Dave Brock and John, you and I have probably talked about it, you know, from a vendor perspective, and even when I, the term high quality deal, we're thinking like the win happens when we close the deal. I, I don't know of any customer that completes a three-year procurement process or 18-month procurement process or even six-month procurement process. And when they sign the deal with Salesforce or whatever, they're ringing the bell because they're so excited they signed the deal, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. They're excited when they get value from it. And so we almost have to sell past the deal and get people to see and visualize what the change is going to look like and recognize it. Because I used to think that how companies view technology strategically, it's one of the key points of ETAs, was the most important thing. But now I don't. It's really the, the willingness of a company to change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about all the vendors that are trying to get people to move to their new things. One of the vendors that you guys cover quite a bit. Right. And, you know, it's. You, it's like, what is the pain of change compared to the potential value for that change? And you mm -hmm. have a pretty clear, clear indication why it may not happen as fast as you'd like. So Maureen kind of blew a gasket here. She's like, wait, what? And I was like, what is Maureen talking about? I think she's freaking out over the more you personalize, the more likely you are to see delays and deals. Question mark. So Maureen, if you have a further comment on that, did Hank uh, address that sufficiently or do you have a question there? And then Tracy Webster says, sometimes it is challenging to have multiple tactics, technical language and details. Those are understand that in the plain language to non-technical people is everything. Yeah. So, so well, you do require a lot, Hank, in terms of communications. You, your expectations there are high, I think. Yeah, they are. And I, and we recognize that they're difficult, but but part of it is the folks that struggle to buy need less information than the others. And right, that's kind of this conundrum because you spend all this mm. time to win the mainstream and the really effective buyers and the other folks don't have any time for it. There's often a way of thinking of la layering content. We talk about the idea of progressive engagement. So progressive engagement is the idea that and, and it's a fundamental strategy, right? You got to get, get people's attention and ask them to tell you more. And so you might think of like for implementation plans, you could create an infographic of the five steps for migration. Then you could have an ebook, and then you could actually have mm -hmm. the technical book that guides it. Now, some people are going to want the technical one. Other people are going to be okay with that. And that's where you can start to, to mix and blend it together. But mm -hmm. I will say if you, you know, beyond all this stuff about the chasm and thinking about psychographics of company and how they think about it. The, the thing I will say that is, to me is the most important thing is as I get more and more people in the deal, I need to focus on the things that bring them together versus the things that tear them apart. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, interesting. I guess we all have to become uh, therapists, Hank, to drive these deals forward. It's a, <laughs> it's a good insight. Uh, and Maureen is saying also, crazy but makes sense uh so so you you explain the personalization thing well for her uh she likes the perspective on personas she says no one else is talking about that uh well that's why we have hank on the show maureen I, i've written a few blogs about it people actually joke about it because we actually think personas done right are really powerful the stuff that adele Ravella has mm. done around personas are great. Um, applying it is great, but it often, it's really looking at it in the context of that enterprise deal that we need to look at it versus the other, right? One of the worst things I worry about is, you know, this, uh, and again, I think we overinflate it. The, you know, people say it's B2P, right? And the individual matters. It's the team that matters. It, and, and until we recognize the team and all that, we're actually taking us in the wrong place. <laughs> Yeah, Tracy's saying we need to become therapist moms, giver of tough love, and taskmasters all, all at once. So I, I'm not sure if you're that far off, Tracy, actually, on that. You're not, but I think so. So, so this is where the one of the fundamental assumptions, particularly for the back half of the curve, right? And, you know, and this, John, may get into our debate a little bit about the informed buyer. Maybe the right segue for it. I don't know when you're planning on segueing, but maybe I'll take mm -hmm. over for a minute. Sure, um, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, go, we assume, go for yeah. yeah, I'm trying to, we assume that businesses and people are good at decision making. Mm. Actually, I had a friend that created a company on best practices and decision making, and you see how poor they are, right? And, and it's both unintentional and somewhat intentional, right? Because it's all sort of behavioral economics and, and human biases and things like that. But who, what executive would say, I'm not confident in my decision making skills? 
But so we assume that they aren't, are, and, and often they're not. And the opportunity we have actually for these other customers. So, and this is again, sort of that shift from the ones that know how they buy. The ones that know how they buy, they want a lot of content. They want a lot of what we call buyer enablement to help them build the case internally. But we should be looking at them and say, who are they having involved in the deals? And what responsibilities are they having? Because then when we go to simplify for the other group, rather than try and assume and just say, well, I wonder who's on the deal, we tell them. We tell them you need to do a security review now because if you wait till later, it's going to delay the purchase by six months. We've seen it happen over and over and over again. Mm. So you actually can guide and coach them and that makes it easier for them. And, and so part of this ownership is teaching them how to buy this stuff. And mm. that helps build confidence that they can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let's get into this a little bit further because uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the a little flash of insight that I had today about this. Uh, but let me just summarize for, for the viewers a little bit about how I think this debate of sorts between our viewpoints came about. Uh, one of the core views that I have had since we started Digonomica is sort of that there that there is such a thing as the informed buyer and that uh, uh, buyers essentially have a much sharper BS detector than they once did for a variety of reasons, including the rise of peer review sites, uh, that that sense of being more connected to uh, critical viewpoints, uh, you know, like certain analyst firms used to be viewed, for example, with almost like, uh, I don't know, religious fervor, whereas obviously now you see much more, you know, even firms like the register piling on and like, so there's just more of a, I think, satirical bent around things. So I have said, well, that has enormous implications for vendors because you really can't market and communicate the same way you have to think about how to reach people in a different way with a different tone at different points because of that. And I'm not really going to back off from any of that. And I don't think you probably disagree with it, but I think what you kept coming back to though, was you would say, yes, but buying is complex and you don't want to imply that buying decisions are now this efficient process, right? Like, yeah. I think one of your key points is that there's a lot of organizational entropy. You even talk a lot in your blogs about the danger of no decisions, right? That <laughs> we talk about buyers all the time as if we're implying they always make decisions. And you you often point out they're not all often, sometimes they don't even make the decision. It's a total fail as a process. And so I think that's the essence of that debate. And I think it's a very interesting one. Yeah. So our, our data shows that it's almost 50% of decisions result of buying efforts result, result in no decisions. Um, again, that number yeah. varies. The folks that are lousy buyers have a much higher percentage of no decisions. Um, but I think part of this is, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to call out, you know, since we're this, I'm going to call it Andrea true connection. Cause do you remember the like disco hit more, more, more that was sampled in steal my sunshine Lynn? Oh yeah. Okay. Right? So it goes like more, how do you like it? And we don't like it. So if you think about it, we have more people on the buying team. We have more departments participating. We have more choices, right? The concept of a short list is no longer exists. Like we can talk about that. And we have more information. So it's more, 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 more. And everything you see in behavioral economics, when I have more, I'm more likely not to make a decision. And so part of it is I have all these choices and you kind of called it out as the opening, John, right? It's like, who do I trust? And it's not, I shouldn't just trust one. But when it's multiple, you get a lot of people wondering, I got so much information. What did I miss? Mm. Right. Now, what we do see is that, and, you know, for the informed buyer, one of the biggest reasons vendors get rejected is when buyers discover conflicting or confusing information. So if they have a source that trusts things one thing and the vendor saying something else, that's diminishing it. And you actually, again, have this high skepticism radar when we have over half the market being pessimistic about technology purchases too. So mm -hmm. the opportunity is there for a truly more informed buyer. The opportunity is there for a much more effective buying process that has the right people involved. It's just companies need help to capture that opportunity. Yeah. And by the way, just since you made a music reference, I do want to share to our listeners that back in 2019, you wrote a blog post referencing Devo 
uh, the devolution of enterprise technology buying inspired by um, by when I kind of referenced uh, through being cool um, <laughs> when I shared your blog post in my weekly hits and misses roundup. So uh, I appreciate your, I think you're the only one who's been inspired to make a musical reference based on mine. So, so, so but I, those, I did that post and I did a post where that I called burning down the messaging house. It yeah, a, I remember that one too. That one. Yeah, the talking those heads. Yeah, those were my favorite blog posts I ever wrote, and they just they didn't seem to get the pickup of others. So maybe folks will go back and search for those two and and see if you have a look at my those were keepers. parody proudness. proudness. Marine wants to hear more about why the shortlist doesn't exist. So let's let's go down that rabbit hole for a sec. Okay. So one of the fundamental things that I think everyone has said about buying, and we largely believe it, is that buying is non-linear. Right. Again, because of the informed buyer, I may start at a review site before I've even thought about considering a purchase. Right. I may a friend may tell me to look at stuff and then I got to build the business case for it. So we're trying to test what are points in the process where it may cycle or go in a different area. And so one of the questions we ask is, have you ever added vendors to your shortlist after it's initially created? We've asked this a couple of times. The last time that we asked, it was actually the study we did during the pandemic. 76% said they do that more than 50% of the time. Yep. 98% said they did it at least once. Right. Now, when we asked them why, we took it to the next level. Because whenever I present that, everyone says, well, it's everyone doing it because they don't know procurement rules. Well, that, that happens about 45, 50% of the time. The other one that happens about the same amount of the time was that they actually don't like any of the vendors that they put on the short list after they do the thorough evaluation. So that's a legit reason. But then the others are, we discovered a vendor we hadn't heard of. We heard about a, a peer told us about a vendor or a third party told us about a vendor. And so this constant change in like the, the short list fluxing mm. and back and forth, you know, it's, it's both risk for vendors, but it's also opportunity. Um, that, you know, not to say if, if you're targeting your ideal customers and you don't make a short list, don't give up. Um, but then we could go down a whole nother realm of whether vendors spend much time actually thinking about ideal customers, but that's maybe a talk for another time. Yeah. And, 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 and I think for clarity here, I don't think Hank, Hank is actually saying that the short list as a, as a practical way of, of narrowing decisions doesn't exist anymore he's saying that the static locked in short list where once you reach that point you know it's that all aboard the airline thing of like you can't board the plane anymore well you can still board the short list plane even <laughs> when it appears to be leaving the the tarmac so that's that's a good probably good news for a lot of vendors um alan you you said earlier buyers make decisions intellectually emotionally and then i think you might have had an autocorrect thing there sorry to expose your typo um, but maybe you want to follow up on whatever you were trying to say there because it didn't quite come out. Um, and, and Thomas just said that is adding to the short list necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't think it is. Uh, I think it's just a, a shift to make a note of. Right. It, it's, it's not a bad thing if it's done for good reasons, right? I think part of, part of the thing to think about is that when we think about the, the challenging decisions is that people lose sight of what their original goal is. And, and if it's causing them to, to drift, that's where they can get into indecision and something that's very, dis, you know, disappointing for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think another thing we could get another rabbit hole is the way in which criteria are shifting. I think with, as SAS gets more and more entrenched, we see a little lot less emphasis on kind of the functionality sort of, uh, cross-checking comparisons you know i've done a lot of case studies this year on this where uh buyers went with SaaS vendors that didn't have as much functionality but had a faster and more nimbler approach um so it's just interesting how these criteria do shift uh getting a lot of interesting comments but mostly just around how the shortlist dynamic is changing so let me just tell you sort of how I'm sort of reconciling some of this debate now that I thought about it today which is like I think I think the the so-called informed buyer is is a reality like to your point there can be information overload um but I think there is this sense in which buyers have better bs detectors than they used to and I think that's a good thing but where I think um you know, at first I was kind of thinking of it, well, you know, high performing companies that are committed to transformation make 
better decisions. I think that might be true to an extent. Uh, and I think some of that shows up in your research, but yeah. I think, I think the key is really that just because you have a sharp BS detector doesn't mean that you're going to execute on a buying decision and then execute on a project. I think those are different skills, if that makes sense. In other words, being able to think critically is helpful, but that doesn't mean you can move the needle organizationally, right? Because I, I could have a very strong, clear opinion about something, but I'm not, I'm no longer the sole decision maker and budget holder for most buying purposes. So I think that's how some of this starts to get reconciled. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair. And I think, again, if I if, if you use the chasm graphic, the informed buyer definitely sits on the left half side of the curve, right? The other one is where you may have pockets that are informed, but that challenge. One thing that was really interesting, we did a study where we actually didn't focus on traditional decision makers, we focused on users. And it was really how they might influence um, adoption patterns of software and also whether they would be attracted to things like freemium and free trial, almost like the product-led growth within the user committee. What we found was that in organizations where users felt that IT did a lousy job in terms of equipping them with the tools they need, they're much more likely to pursue freemium and free products. Um, sometimes they're successful in getting them adopted, sometimes they aren't. But again, we use the ETAs to do this and, and we, we see clear patterns there. There's an element of this where it's also about mindset, right? And this is like a mindset for companies. Um, com you know, whether you wanna buy whole hog into the growth mindset or just positive attitudes um, versus others, there's dramatic differences in that. And that kind of plays into the confidence factor. I worry about the informed buyer idea with those folks like the conflicted laggards and reluctant followers, because mm. I actually feel like they are the skeptical or the pessimist buyer. So rather than mm. thinking critically, they're thinking negative about it, nearly everything. And mm. if they could bring back and, and say, you know, I need to look at this with a healthy BS detector, but I also have to be clear on what I'm looking for as and what I would consider to be positive evidence not sure they're doing enough of that and that contributes to some of their challenges by the way uh some of my favorite posts on digonomica i have a whole series on the informed buyer on digonomica some of my favorites involve my dialogue with hank hall if you do a search on my name and hank barnes on digonomica you'll find a bunch of them uh, i'll paste one of them from a couple years ago in there that comes with a podcast on uh reducing enterprise buying complexity uh, that I think some of you folks might enjoy, but if it does link doesn't come out, just do a search on the site. Uh, Thomas has a question and, for and you. And if not, just find the one where you said I actually did a decent webcast. So that's that's yeah, the decent webcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's put putting on a decent webcast is, by the way, still still a lost art. Uh, all these years later, I still haven't seen very many good webcasts. And by the way, folks, just get the promotional crap out of your webcast, please, while we're on that topic. Okay, Thomas says, um, out of curiosity. How to avoid politics in the buying process, he says, in order to get an objective decision. Yeah, good luck avoiding politics in yeah. a buying process. Have fun yeah. with that. Yeah, that is, that's where I was going to go. One of the things, so um, to, first, I'll, I'll answer the question in a second, but it's, it's kind of interesting. One of the questions that we've asked in the new study, and I have no idea if it's going to work, um, but is, you know, we ask what made you choose a particular product? Like ultimately what was the thing and what, or what made you choose a service provider or the reseller who you bought the product from? And then we have an open-ended question where we ask, if you were talking to a friend privately, what would you tell them is the reason you chose this? So we're hoping we'll get some mm. real answers there. We did, we did get one, you know, the early results when we're doing data checking and my favorite answer that's come back so far is like, I would never impose on my friends anything about what we buy in my company. <laughs> so, yeah, right. So that was a good answer. But in terms of, if you look at decision-making best practices, right? And because part of that is, you know, do we want to behave? It's, it starts, and, and these are kind of the fundamentals. It starts with being very clear on the goals and making sure everyone on the team is, a cl is clear on what we are trying to accomplish. Um, the second thing is then you look at your options and you actually force yourself to add one more option than what you're thinking about. And, and if you think about today's technology world, options can come in a lot of different shapes and forms. You have a lot of different choices and paths. You know, and then it's getting different perspectives on those options, exploring what's positive and what's negative, doing pre-mortems and post-mortems and all of that behind it. And that can start to reduce it. 
part of the things that we saw is when we look at the composition of buying teams, um, we break things down into people that are participating that are active or occasional. And an occasional mm -hmm. participant basically sits in on some meetings or maybe they're a decision maker that has to approve. When we saw occasional decision makers in deals, the likelihood of a high quality deal significantly diminishes. Like if there's no occasional decision makers, you're at about a 45% high quality deal rate. If they're there, it's down to about 16. And part of that is if I know I'm going to have this situation, we sometimes forget that they weren't in all the meetings. So rather than go to them just saying, we want to do this, you actually have to take them through the decision process. This is what we are trying to accomplish. These are the things we looked at. This is how we evaluated them. And therefore, our recommendation is this. Now, that gives you the best chance to take politics out of it, but there's no guarantee that it will. Mm, absolutely. I want to get back to your post for, for just a second, and then I have a self-serving thing on influencers I want to get into. I before thought we, we were wrap. taking all the self-serving stuff out of the webcast and podcast. Uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> Except I, I allowed at the very end, if you provide like an hour's worth of value, then you can pimp for a little bit. Um, <laughs> good point though, Hank. Thanks for keeping me on, on my toes here. Uh, I, I just want to read this because I think this is a really important point. Um, in this, this is from your same post on democratization. Um, business people just want their problems solved and the SaaS revolution gave them a way to solve them without going through a cumbersome procurement process. But, and this is the big point, as use expanded all of a sudden, all those other issues surfaced regarding compatibility, integration, security, and more. The result, frustration and confidence erosion for those encounter these surprises. What initially seemed easy seemed very hard and the likelihood of bringing people less skilled in enterprise decisions grows. So I thought, think that's a really interesting point, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, this so-called SaaS buying revolution and why it's actually pretty tricky. Yeah. I, and, you know, what we see with that is that we see this group that we call, um, we call them ambitious leaders. They're business-led and they're very dynamic. They'll adopt some stuff really fast, but they have a low percentage of high-quality deals. And I think, you know, that's where we started to interpret this. And that's one of the questions we get from vendors all the time. How do I sell to business or how do I sell to IT? And they always treat it as an either-or, and it's never either-or. It's it's a connected story now more than ever. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, when you start to look at it, no one, again, unless people are behaving badly, no one intentionally makes a decision to be a bad security risk or a decision that can't scale, but they may not have all that exposure. Um, in this work we've done around business technologists, we have this thing we call fusion teams. Um, some might think of it as agile teams if agile was done right, but you know, we, we need a name. Um, <laughs> And we studied fusion team leaders and we saw some interesting things. One was if they were making technology decisions, even if IT was on it, 70% of the decisions they made didn't follow IT's recommendations, even if IT was on it. But then we also did this uh, assessment that we characterize as what we call having sound digital judgment. And only 22% of fusion team leaders exhibited sound digital judgment. And it's things like taking ownership of what you're creating, like I, you know, or do I expect IT to then support it? Or if a security thing happens, is that part of my problem? And we need to spend more time as this stuff gets distributed, helping people throughout the organization that think they know technology, right? Again, everyone's somewhat familiar with technology, thinking about those enterprise implications and oftentimes recognizing that our use cases may have changed. So we may not, you know, the, the, the mandate and governance in only way doesn't work, but the total ignoring it doesn't work. And we need to find a bridge. That's actually some research partners doing for CIOs right now. I think my all time favorite and a couple of details have faded over the years was uh, Robert Scoble, who at the time was incredibly influential still is to some extent on consumer tech stuff was working for Rackspace and he was loving his expense app that he was using, I think called Expensify. And then, and then I, and then Rackspace, I believe it was Rackspace. Don't hold me to it. Went with Workday for expenses. And he went on this huge tirade, uh, you know, around like, I'm not using that. And Expensify works so much better. And, you know, I just thought it was this classic tension between like, Oh, this, I love this app. And then 
I hate this enterprise thing I'm being forced to use. And then a couple weeks later came the more apologetic blog post. Uh, I got a briefing on work day and it turns out they have a little more to offer than I thought and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But, but, you yeah. know, just that classic thing of like, yeah, there's reasons why enterprises go a certain direction and it doesn't always cater to everything that you want. And all those tensions are very real, I think. So, yeah, the folks like that, one of the things we discovered, the, the, the personalities of people that pursue freemiums and free trials are basically very active in terms of promoting stuff positively and negatively on social media. So anyone doing a product-led growth strategy out there, social is your key. You're looking for users that are active, either complaining about their stuff or happy with their stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and then uh, we need to close the loop on on this whole thing. What did Jeffrey Moore think of, of you revising his um, his graphic? Did he ultimately buy into that? He did. I mean, the, there, there's a post on LinkedIn that, yes, I use in some presentations where he basically connected with the idea of with more distributed decision making. Um that you needed to think more about the when and why and, the, and that he liked the psychographic model that we built. Now, the thing mm -hmm. about that first blog post, I did use our marketing clusters. And again, marketing mm -hmm. clusters reflect organizations that behave similarly, but timing is different. But I didn't use the original ETAs, which I have since then, because I actually got yelled at a little bit by Jeffrey. Because mm -hmm. I was describing and, and building the case to say, here's why we see this happening. And what we largely use, and actually even the, the thing, John, you, you at Diginomica, you guys did an experiment with it. We, we, when we first created them, we created nicknames. And at the time, we thought all the profiles were just choices. There weren't good and bad profiles. So the nicknames ended up being somewhat meaningless. As we were learning more about it, I said, this is like Myers-Briggs. So I'm an INTJ, and they're an FID or whatever. And I took that to Jeffrey, and he's like, you got to have nicknames. And I said, we had nicknames. He's like, but they didn't work. He goes, they're just lousy nicknames. You have to have nicknames. <laughs> uh, so we got together, and I didn't, have it. I didn't want to delay the blog post, but we now have nicknames for them. So let me give you the nicknames in case you haven't seen it. So, oh, great. Um, the FIDs, who are your classic early adopters, innovators, we call agile leaders. They're agile, they're leaders, they're typically the fastest to do stuff. The ABD group, they're accommodating business-led and dynamic. They're ambitious leaders. They'd love to be first, but they make a few more mistakes. Then we have the two strict planning organizations, SCD and SIR. And I know these are a lot of nicknames. If you look at the blogs, you'll get explanation. SCDs are classic fast followers. Like mm -hmm. fast followers, a fantastic strategy. If you execute it right, they do it really well. The SIR are more disciplined followers, right? They, they're a little bit more cautious, a little bit more risk averse. And then I have nicknames that really describe the folks on the back half of the curve. So the ACR group that's middle of the road, they're accommodating, responsive. They don't want to do anything. We call them reluctant followers, mm. right? They, they're still probably mainstream, but they buy reluctantly. The, there's a group that says they want to move fast. So they're flexible, but they're measured FCM. They're actually the biggest population of companies we call conflicted laggards. Mm. And here's some of the conflicts. More than any other company, they view technology tactically. But more than any other company, they want to customize everything. <laughs> so they have, oh, and then the last group, the ABM. I'm, I'm scared group, of the conflicted laggards. Yeah. But they're the they, biggest. They scare me they're a the bit. biggest companies that are out there, and they're the biggest waste of time for vendors. They'll suck your mm. time. The last group Ouch. we call them disinterested laggards because they really don't want tech at all. Ooh, uh oh, yeah. So if if you guys do a search on uh, Hank Barnes democratization chasm LinkedIn, you can see an interesting comment thread, including Jeffrey Moore's response to Hank's post, which is cool. The kind of always a moment of suspense when someone comments on, on your model like that. And he says, Hank's more nuanced model is a function of the increasingly broader federation of purchasing decisions, giving rise to a sociographic that incorporates, but goes further than the one at the heart of crossing the chasm. Great jobs. So not, not too bad there, Hank. Uh, cool. it, it takes a lot of skill to challenge someone on, on some of their ideas and then have them embrace it. So good job. Thanks. All right. What's your thing? What have you discovered recently? Got to let you have your time. Oh, well, no, no, no. It wasn't <laughs> anything recently. It was just that, um, that one of the things that I thought was really cool about your perspective is that you, in your research, you, you acknowledged that, that buying this, buying decisions and buyers take into account a number of independent and external viewpoints you know, which I thought was really cool because let's let's be frank. I mean, 
you know, it's not necessarily in Gardner's best interest to say that. I mean, in, in some ways, you know, you're kind of saying, well, there's a bunch of people that buyers listen to, and I thought it was cool that you just followed the data. Now, of course, that the reason I said self-serving is that's obviously self-serving for Diginomica, right? Because in a world where buyers only listen to Gartner, our influence and our importance goes down considerably. So <laughs> I want to acknowledge to our viewers, there's a self-interest part in that. But I just thought it was cool that you're willing to let the data tell you what buyers need and you'll, and you'll follow that along. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the reality of buyers, right? And you know, you're not, no one has the sole source of great ideas. You know, Gartner, frankly, recognizes it herself. That's why we're investing in peer review sites, right? Um, right. You know, it, there, you know, say what you want. Gartner has a very savvy management team that looks, that recognizes that people are looking at lots of different places. The one thing I'd mm -hmm. say about influencers, that's really fascinating to me. Um, when we look at our buying research, overwhelmingly people tell us they look to influencers in the middle of their buying process. Some mm -hmm. use them to help get ideas initially. If you want to improve the buying process, and this might be another thing to address Thomas's comment about taking politics out as well. Um, as you're at your final recommendation, take that to a third party that's independent. Take them through what you looked at and why and get their feedback, right? Do it in enough time where if they have some feedback, they might. Because that's where we see a lot of people drop off on it. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, that decision-making is where the politics and the complexity and actually having a voice outside the room may be the mo most valuable for people. If you have a quick question for Hank, uh, get it in soon because we're going to wrap in, in a sec. Uh, that uh, thing came, that came from a post I did a couple years ago why enterprise buyers trust influencers on uh, Diginomica, which is about your research. I just want to read a couple of things from that post because I think a lot of the folks that are watching today are, are striving to achieve that type of influence. So let me read this now. Uh, individual buyers perceive influencers differently, but key factors for influence include the respect the influencer has in the customer community, the brand respect of the firm the influencer is associated with, and the specific expertise of that influencer. In other words, you might be an expert in ERP evaluation, but not cloud virtualization, et cetera. One factor that stands out to Barnes, the perceived independence of that influencer. If influencers have shown they're truly independent in their views, that evokes a higher level of trust than the feedback of partners, employees, or even peers. So I, th I thought that was super interesting, a kind of a good note to end on and just how powerful that is when you have even more influence than, than, than the peers of that individual, that's a big deal. Cool. So thanks. Thanks Hank for, for validating our existence with your data. Otherwise <laughs> we'd have an even harder road to hoe on the outside of things, but it, I, I love this type of dialogue and I really appreciate your willingness to, to engage in it. Um, I think the research you do is really essential and, and thank you for taking the time to to share this momentous little interaction you have with, with Jeffrey and your go. blog. Awesome. Thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. Always good talking about buyers. Absolutely. Thanks all for joining. That was a lively chat. I appreciate you coming through towards the second part of the chat. I'm not sure we're going to do a show for the next couple of weeks. I'm on the road next week and then we have Thanksgiving, but I will be back on Friday afternoons, hopefully with more guests that can reach the same level of dialogue. Uh, thank you, Maureen, for being here. Uh, was great and we will keep it going. Take care. See you later. Thanks all.